Well, hello. Thank you all for joining me here in the Ozarks. I'm Willie from uh, from the Ozarks. <laughs> it's where I'm at. I'm here at my place. And uh, I'm, we're ready for Lesson 12 in A Course in Miracles workbook for students. We're reading from the original edition here on January the 12th of 2023. I am upset because I see a meaningless world. Huh. I am upset because I see a meaningless world. The importance of this idea lies in the fact that it contains a correction for a major perceptual distortion. You think that what upsets you is a frightening world, a sad world, a violent world, or an insane world. All these attributes are given it by you. The world is meaningless in itself. These exercises are done with eyes open. Look around you this time quite slowly. Try to pace yourself so that the slow shifting of your glance from one thing to another involves a fairly constant time interval. Do not allow the time of the shift to become marketably longer or shorter, but try instead to keep a measured, even tempo throughout. What you see does not matter. You teach yourself this as you give whatever your glance rests on equal attention and equal time. This is a beginning step in learning to give them all equal value. As you look about you, say to yourself, I think I see a fearful world, a dangerous world, a hostile world, a sad world, a wicked world, a crazy world, and then you fill, you fill in the blank, whatever you see, and so on, using whatever descriptive terms happen to occur to you. If terms which seem positive rather than negative occur to you, include them. For example, you might think of a good world or a satisfying world. If such terms occur to you, use them along with the rest. You may not yet understand why these nice adjectives belong in these exercises. But remember that a good world implies a bad one, and a satisfying world implies an unsatisfying one. All terms which cross your mind are suitable subjects for today's exercises. Their seeming quality does not matter. Be sure that you do not alter the time interval between applying today's idea to what you think is pleasant and what you think is unpleasant. <laughs> for the purposes of these exercises, there is no difference between them. At the end of the practice period, add but I am upset because I see a meaningless world. So after you've looked around, then you're going to say, but I'm upset because I see a meaningless world. What is meaningless is neither good nor bad. Why then should a meaningless world upset you? If you could accept the world as meaningless and let the truth be written upon it for you, it would make you indescribably happy. Well, that's what we want. We want the Holy Spirit to tell us how to see the world so we can be indescribably happy. I'd say that's the peace that passes understanding or human understanding. But because it is meaningless, you are impelled to write upon it what you would have it be. And it is this you see in it. It is this that is meaningless in truth. It is this what you've put on it by the ego that is by the separated self. Think of it that way that is meaningless in truth. Beneath your words is written the Word of God. Beneath your words is written the Word of God. The truth upsets you now, but when your words have been erased, you will see His. That is the ultimate purpose of these exercises, to see God's Word and to, to feel His Word, to follow His Word, <laughs> to revel in His Word to make yourself indescribably happy with his way of looking at the world. Three or four times are enough for practicing the idea for today, nor should the practice periods exceed a minute. Oh, we're only supposed to take one minute at this. You may find even this too long. Terminate the exercises whenever you experience a sense of strain. Well, he doesn't want us to feel any strain or effort when we do these exercises. 
So, uh, so do them, do them, you know, take your minute. How many times to say about four times today? So, uh, all right, well, we'll come back and we'll do that before we, uh, before we pass while I'm singing, you can kind of look around and, and do it as I'll give you a little time in the song or I'll, I'll hope to anyway. <laughs> okay. Let's go take a look now at, um, our uh, text reading and we're ready for, uh, chapter two, which is the illusion of separation, section three, healing as release from fear. And we'll pick up in paragraph, uh, let's pick up in 63 instead of 64. 64 is where we left off yesterday. And we'll finish this section. Uh, while you're turning there, let me tell you about another, uh, let, me, let me get myself to get where the wind doesn't blow this. And let me tell you about another um, apple tree out of uh, edible landscaping. And this is also an Arkansas black, but it's called the Arkansas black spur apple. A little different cultivar. It's still a Malus domestica. Enterprise, inter, uh, excuse me, not enterprise, Arkansas black spur apple. Arkansas black spur is a more compact form of Arkansas black apple. In spur growth, the buds of the branches are close together. The result is more flowering and leafing in a shorter distance. Since the branching is not as long, the tree is smaller but very well rooted and anchored to the ground since it's grafted on a seedling root. Fruits are large and very dark red, keeps for months in storage, non-browning and fruit salads. Well, that's interesting, non-browning and fruit salads. A very good tree for hot summer areas and needs five to 600 hours of winter temperatures below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Height 10 feet and same width, self-fertile, space 12 foot circles, zone five to eight. Really good here in the Ozarks. Of course, that was probably origination was there in Bentonville, Arkansas for that Arkansas black we found out yesterday. And very likely the spur apple may have come from the same area. I don't know. Don't know the history on it yet. Okay, let's take a look at uh, paragraph 63 in chapter two, section three, uh, the healing and release from fear or healing and release from fear. We have already said that the miracle is an expression of miracle mindedness. Miracle mindedness, miracle mindedness merely means right mindedness in the sense that we are now using it. The right minded neither exalt nor depreciate the mind of the miracle worker or the miracle receiver. However, as a creative act, the miracle need not await the right mindedness of the receiver. In fact, its purpose is to restore him to his right mind. It is essential, however, that the miracle worker be in his right mind, or he will be unable to reestablish right mindedness in someone else. It reminds me of what Yogananda used to say. He said, always work on your own self-realization before you try to help someone else because you'll be helping them the most by becoming self-realized yourself. The healer, the healer, so let me read that again. It is essential, however, that the miracle worker be in his right mind or he will be unable to reestablish right-mindedness in someone else. Paragraph 64. The healer who relies on his own readiness is endangering his understanding. He's perfectly safe as long as he is completely unconcerned about his readiness, but maintains a consistent trust in mine. Yeah, that's Jesus talking. <laughs> if your miracle working propensities are not functioning properly, it is always because fear has intruded on your right mindedness and has literally upset it or turned it upside down. <laughs> your miracle working propensities. It's like you're, you got wings, but you're not, they're not, you're not using them. They're not, you're not flying yet. <laughs> All forms of not right mindedness are the result 
of refusal to accept the atonement for yourself. If the miracle worker does accept it, he places himself in a position to recognize that those who need to be healed are simply those who have not realized that right-mindedness is healing. 65. The sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. This means that he recognizes that mind is the only creative level and that its errors are healed by the atonement. Once he accepts this, his mind can only heal. Once he accepts this, his mind can only heal. By denying his mind any destructive potential and reinstating its purely constructive powers, he has placed himself in a position where he can undo the level confusion of others. The message he then gives to others is the truth that their minds are similarly constructive and that their miscreations cannot hurt them. By affirming this, the miracle worker releases the mind from over-evaluating its own learning device, the body, and restores the mind to its true position as the learner. Paragraph 66. It should be emphasized again that the body does not learn any more than it creates. As a learning device, it merely follows the learner. But if it is falsely endowed with self-initiative, it becomes a serious obstruction to the very learning it should facilitate. Only the mind is capable of illumination. The soul is already illuminated, and the body in itself is too dense <laughs> to be illuminated. <laughs> The mind, however, can bring its illumination to the body by recognizing that density is the opposite of intelligence and therefore unamenable to independent learning. It is, however, easily brought into alignment with a mind which has learned to look beyond density toward light. Wow, a mind that has learned to look beyond density toward light. 67. Corrective learning always begins with the awakening of the spiritual eye and the turning away from the belief in physical sight. Let's read that one again. Corrective learning always begins with the awakening of the spiritual eye and the turning away from the belief in physical sight. You know, that was you, that inner world where you see with... Uh, with uh, the unseen eye, the single eye, as Jesus, I think, is what I think he was referring to in the Bible when he, he said, let the eye be single and the whole body will be full of light. The reason this is so often, the reason this so often entails fear is because man is afraid of what his spiritual eye will see. We said before that the spiritual eye cannot see error and is capable of only of looking beyond it to the defense of the atonement. We said before that the spiritual eye cannot see error and is capable only of looking beyond it to the defense of atonement. There is no doubt that the spiritual eye does produce extreme discomfort by what it sees. <laughs> there is no doubt that the spiritual eye does produce extreme discomfort by what it sees. Yet what man forgets is that the discomfort is not the final outcome of his perception. When the spiritual eye is permitted to look upon the defilement of the altar, it also looks immediately towards the atonement. So a little bit of maybe fear or shock, but be at peace and let the Holy One lead you to repair the, what you have miscreated, what you have twisted into some grotesque of growing a, a grotesque appearance nothing the spiritual eye perceives can induce fear everything that results from accurate spiritual awareness is merely channelized toward correction discomfort is aroused only to bring the need for correction forcibly into awareness <laughs> i love that 
discomfort is aroused. Every time you feel a little discomfort, remind yourself, well, discomfort is aroused only to bring the need for correction into awareness. And he actually says forcibly into awareness. What the physical eye sees is not corrective, nor can it be corrected by any device which can be seen physically. As long as a man believes in what his physical sight tells him, all his corrective behavior will be misdirected. The real vision is obscured because man cannot endure to see his own defiled altar. But since the altar has been defiled, his state becomes doubly dangerous unless it is perceived. 69. The fear of healing arises in the end from an unwillingness to accept the unequivocal fact that healing is necessary. Let's read that again. The fear of healing arises in the end from an unwillingness to accept the unequivocal fact that healing is necessary. Man is not willing to look on what he has done to himself. Healing is an ability lent to man after the separation, before which it was completely unnecessary. Like all aspects of the space-time belief, healing ability is temporary. However, as long as time persists, healing is needed as a means for human protection. This is because healing rests on charity, and charity is a way of perceiving the perfection of another, even if he cannot perceive it himself. <laughs> well, isn't that beautiful? Um, let's, let's look at it again. Like all aspects of the space-time belief, healing ability is temporary. However, as long as time persists, healing is needed as a means for human protection. This is because healing rests on charity, and charity is a way of perceiving the perfection of another, even if he cannot perceive it himself. You see it for him. See his perfection. Wow, that's charity. Most of the loftier concepts of which man is capable now are time-dependent. Charity is really a weaker reflection of a much more powerful love encompassment, which is far beyond any form of charity that man can conceive of as yet. Love encompassment. <laughs> love is everywhere. At Babanam Kevalam. God is love and love is all there is. Charity is essential to right-mindedness in the limited sense in which right-mindedness can now be attained. Charity is a way of looking at another as if he had already gone far beyond his actual accomplishments in time. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Charity is a way of looking at another as if he had already gone far beyond his actual accomplishments in time. You can see yourself that way too, you know. Since his own thinking is faulty, he cannot see the atonement for himself, or he would have no need for charity. Since his own thinking is faulty, he cannot see the atonement for himself, or he would have no need for charity. The charity which is accorded him is both an acknowledgement that he is weak and a recognition that he could be stronger. In the last paragraph, 71 for this section, the way in which both of these perceptions are stated clearly implies their dependence on time, making it quite apparent that charity lies within the human limitations, though toward its higher levels. We said before that only revelation transcends time. The miracle is an expression of true human charity. The miracle as an expression of true human charity can only shorten time at most. It must be understood, however, that whenever a man offers a miracle to another, he is shortening the suffering of both. It must be understood, however, that whenever a man offers a miracle to another, you know, offer him charity, that's a miracle, to see them far beyond what they have actually accomplished in time, you see it for him. That's a miracle. 
It must be understood, however, that whenever a man offers a miracle to another, he is shortening the suffering of both. <laughs> you and your brother that you're seeing their holiness. This introduces a correction into the whole record in which corrects retroactively as well as progressively. And I expect that whole record, he probably wouldn't want to say it in this, in this but I think that he's talking about the Akashic record. But it's the record, whether, which, whatever you call it, doesn't matter. The ones of you know about the Akashic record know what I'm talking about. But it's just the record, the great book that opens at the end of time. Maybe you could think of it that way. Okay, let's go back and take a look at I am upset because I see a meaningless world and we've got to, we'll, we'll take a little time to sing our song. Uh, let's see, how, let's be sure that uh, we know what we're going to do in this lesson. I'm upset because I see a meaningless world. Uh, we're going to use an even tempo to look at the world. We'll do this with our eyes open. And we're just going to say, I think I see, and the examples he gives is a fearful world, a dangerous world, a hostile world, a sad world, a wicked world, a crazy world, a sad world, a violent world, an insane world. He uses all those descriptive terms there. Um, and, uh, and he says that you can use nice adjectives too, like a satisfying world, because that implied an un could, you could have an unsatisfying world. Uh, and... Uh, Let's see, does, let's, let's, let's remember, um, and then at the end of your mind searching and your open-eyed observations of the world, you're going to tell yourself, um, but I'm upset because I see a meaningless world. Basically repeat the way we started this lesson. And, uh, and do this three or four times, and if, it, if you sense it for about a minute, if there's some strain involved, well, then you can... Uh, close, you know, make it less time, but do it three or four times today, all right? Now, let's see, let's make sure I'm tuned, okay? I hate to have to take time to make sure my guitar is tuned, but... Okay, thank you very much. I'm upset because I see a meaningless world. can do your lesson as I'm singing if you want. I'll give you a little time in, in the song to, to actually specifically do it for, for about a minute. I am upset because I see a meaningless world, a meaningless world. I think I see a fearful world. A dangerous world, a hostile world, a sad world, a wicked world, a crazy world, an insane world. I think I see, and you all do it. I think I see. Uh-huh. 
hostile world A sad world A wicked world A crazy world I think I see A fearful world A dangerous world A hostile world a sad world, a wicked world, a crazy world, I think I see, but I'm upset, because I see, a meaningless world, a meaningless world. But I'm upset because I see a meaningless world, <laughs> a meaningless world. I am upset because I see a meaningless world. Thank you all so much for joining me. See you tomorrow. Practice this three or four times today. I am upset because I see a meaningless world. <laughs>